So we're here tonight with Paul, author and wildlife filmmaker, Paul Rosalie. For those of you who are not familiar with the Academy of Science, I'm going to take just a moment to tell you a little bit about who we are. We're an independent science organization. We're supported entirely through community contributions. And at venues throughout the region, we connect science and the community through free and or very low cost public talks, science seminars and workshops, and trips and tours that feature scientists and engineering professionals of both national and international renown. In addition to advancing the public understanding of science, it's our mission to inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates, which we do by offering a full array of free and low-cost opportunities expressly for teens, such as our Teen Science Cafes, STEM Teens Youth Leadership Council, Junior Academy of Science, and the Regional Academy of Science St. Louis Science Fair and Honors Division. The Junior Academy is a pre-professional STEM membership organization for students from the full range of academic backgrounds in grades 6 through 12. It offers free, hands-on opportunities in science, engineering, and medicine. Teens can attend behind-the-scenes explorations of leading engineering, technology, and science labs of our region, access university libraries, participate in field opportunities and challenging and engaging science competitions, and Junior Academy members make real-world connections, meeting top STEM professionals. You can find more information on the Junior Academy and all of our community-wide science events and programs by visiting our website at academyofsciencestl.org. You may also visit us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Or before you leave tonight, pick up some of the literature that's on the table just outside the auditorium or sign up on one of the e-news sheets that will make their way around the audience this evening to receive Academy e-news of upcoming events and programs. Uh, I do want to mention just a couple upcoming Academy events that you might have an interest in attending. And if you are a student, you might want to check with your teacher. Many teachers offer extra credit for attending Academy events, and we do provide proof of attendance if needed. So you can come see one of us at the table outside the auditorium after tonight's talk if you need that. Uh, if you're looking for something to do on the Monday holiday, you're welcome to join us for an afternoon of flower picking and learning about science on the farm at our Simple Gifts Flower Farm Tour at 1.30 p.m. in Belleville, Illinois with Megan DeGroot. Megan is a farmer, teacher, and the owner and operator of Simple Gifts Flower Farm. She's been a longtime supporter of sustainable farming and the slow food and slow flower movements. There is a cost to attend. It's $10 for adults and $5 for children 13 and under. You can find more information on this event and register on our website, again, at academyofsciencestl.org. And that same evening at 7 p.m., we're out at Urban Chestnut Brewery and Beer Hall in the Grove for Science Distilled STL, Roots and Brews, the Many Roles of Microbes in Our World, with Kurt Driesner, he's Urban Chestnut's Quality Assurance Manager, and Rhiannon Vargas with the Division of Biology and Biomedical Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. This event is free and open to the public. You do not need to register to attend. And then two more real quick before we introduce our speaker tonight. On Monday, November 4, here in the Living World Anheuser-Busch Theater at 7 p.m., the authors of How to Tame a Fox and Build a Dog are with us for a book signing and lecture on the longest-running experiment in animal behavior, the speeding up of thousands of years of evolution into a few decades in order to witness the process of domestication. It's free and open to the public. And then lastly, on November 6, also here in the Anheuser-Busch Auditorium as part of our science seminar series, American writer, photographer, and musician Kim Heacox will be here at 7 p.m. for an evening of story, humor, and music that captures the wild beauty of Alaska, the importance of community, and the urgency of climate change. Copies of Kim's books, Jimmy Blue Feather, and The Only Kayak will be available for purchase and signing by the author. This event is also free and open to the public, and you don't need to register to attend. Again, you can find more information on these events and all of our community-wide events on the flyers outside of the uh, auditorium tonight on the table or by logging on to our website. Uh, before I introduce our speaker this evening, please turn down cell phone ringers or any other electronic devices that might make noise during tonight's presentation. So with all that said, I'm going to introduce our speaker this evening. Mr. Paul Rosalie. Paul Rosalie is a naturalist, explorer, author, and award-winning wildlife filmmaker. For the past decade, he has specialized in calling attention to the protection of threatened ecosystems and species in countries like Indonesia, Brazil, India, and Peru. In the Amazon, Rosalie has described new ecosystems, 
and launched the first ever study of anacondas in lowland rainforest. He spent extensive time traveling with poachers, documenting the illegal trade in endangered species, and his memoir on Amazonian wildlife and exploration, Mother of God, was hailed as gripping by Jane Goodall. And the Wall Street Journal applauded Rosalie's environmental call to arms for its rare immediacy and depth. In 2013, he spoke at the United Nations Global Forum on Forests while accepting an award for his Amazonian wildlife short film and unseen world. His 2019 debut novel, The Girl and the Tiger, examines the complex modern realities of endangered tigers and elephants in a gripping classic style adventure story based on a true story and one that has been hailed as a modern day jungle book. Both books will be available for purchase and signing following tonight's Q&A just outside the auditorium. Uh, we're pleased he is here with us this evening as a stop on his national book tour for The Girl and the Tiger to talk about jungle giants protecting endangered species in the wildest places on Earth. Won't you please join me in welcoming Paul Rosalie. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, it is awesome to see uh, a crowd. Really, thank you. I literally, last week, you go from place to place. I'm not like a big, famous author. So sometimes I get a huge crowd, and it's great. And then sometimes there's like three people in the audience. And I'm like, uh, I'm like I want to just call my mom and go home. Um, so, I just have to put this up here. Yeah, thank you to the Academy of Sciences and to the zoo for setting this up. I am so excited to be here and to talk to you guys tonight, and I'm especially happy to see how many students are in the audience for a bunch of reasons that I'll explain as I go through this. We only have an hour, and I want to give you guys so much stuff that I'm bringing you from the jungle that I've been experiencing for the last 13 years, so let's go. Um, first off, I'll tell you that I was not born in the jungle. People, um, some, recently someone said something to me. They said, were you born, they asked me if I was born in the jungle like I was Mowgli. Um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm telling you this because there's so many students here, because I was a terrible student. I absolutely never fit in. I absolutely never felt at home. Uh, I always wanted to go to the jungle, and I pretty much lived at the Bronx Zoo in New York. I loved that place, and I think when I was seven years old, my parents made a big mistake because they took me there and two things happened. I saw, I saw an image of a bunch of scientists and they were all standing there and they were holding this like 20 foot anaconda and I was just like, I want that. That's what I want. And then, and then the other thing they showed me which was much more devastating was they took me in the, the, the rainforest house where they actually play you sounds of chainsaws and they show you videos of the big trees going over and that stayed with me. I couldn't sleep. All the, I mean, I was always so connected to animals, catching snakes and frogs and f tracking foxes through the woods of upstate New York. And the thought that all this big, beautiful, amazing stuff that I'd never heard of and wanted to see was going to be gone before I could have the chance to see it, that, that, just, that just devastated me. I mean, I literally used to be crying at night because it was so devastating to me. So um, when I was doing terribly in school, my mom, and I was, I was so upset with everything that had to do with teenage life, my mom hero that she is. Oh, by the way, I'm severely dyslexic, so the fact that I'm writing books is ridiculous, but I was not doing well in school. Um, my mom said, why don't you just get out? She go, you can actually take your GED and go straight into college. And so I did that. I skipped junior and sophomore year of high school and went straight into college, and I started saving up, and I got myself to the Amazon. Now, the Amazon, I'm not going to give you too much stats and figures. I'm going to tell you stories, but I do have to give you this. The Amazon is the biggest rainforest on our planet. When you look at a slide like this, you see that blood red section at the, at the western side of South America? That's the Amazon. And that's, this is coded for vertebrate biodiversity. There's more life in that spot than there is anywhere else on Earth and than there ever has been in the fossil record. This is the most life we've ever seen. And so that's where I wanted to go. And of course, like I said, I'd heard since I was a kid that all, we're losing so much wildlife that we're in the middle of this extinction crisis WWF put out this report that we've lost 50% of the wildlife on our planet since 1970. When I heard that, I honestly thought that the newscasters were going to take out their earpieces and like cars were going to stop in the street and everyone was just going to go, okay, it's time to fix things. Nothing changed. It's just information. No one cared. Um, the Amazon, I mean, there's, just, there's so much life. I could literally just sit here for four hours and show you pictures and stories of the Amazon. but. 
there's so much biodiversity there that we, we call it like Avatar on Earth. It's literally, you have these giant millennium trees and jungles that stretch for as far as the eye can see. I've done surveys in small plains and there's times that you just, you can't see anything but jungle. It's one of the last places where you can go where you literally can't see signs of humans. Um, now I started working with the local people and the, they have the books here tonight and my first book Mother of God is really about that, that time when I was sort of fresh out of being from Brooklyn and started living in the Amazon. And these local guys took me and we started going around barefoot. And they would take me out when they went on hunting expeditions. And as we would go, you know, you'd get a cut and it would get infected. And they would go, oh, you have an infection? Come here. And they'd give you, they'd take the plant and cure your infection. You got an ear infection? They would cure a different plant. They have a whole, a whole pharmacy of stuff in the forest, and they know it all. And so I started learning from them, learning how to use a machete, how to identify things, how to track animals. And what I realized was, now I grew up on Steve Irwin. Loved Steve Irwin. I'd come home from school every day and watch Steve. Um, I had grown up rescuing snakes because a few times I'd been out on hikes and people, I'd heard people go, water moccasin! And some like you know heroic dude would go over with a stick and try and kill this harmless water snake. Um, we don't have water moccasins in New York. Um, so I was, I was rescuing and working with snakes since I, was, since I was quite young, since I was a little kid. And so when I got to the Amazon, these guys, because they, they hunt birds, you know, they have to watch out for jaguars. They, they, they hunt caiman. They, everything they hunt, they, they know every tr species of tree that's a hardwood because they can use it. The one thing that they did not know was snakes. And I knew snakes. So while I was learning, I was receiving this entire like PhD in, in information from these indigenous people, I would pick up a snake and they'd all, they would all jump back and they'd be like, what, what are you doing? And I'd be like, no, no, it's clearly not a venomous snake. And they were like, how can you tell that? And they looked at me like I was Dumbledore and I'd just like done some sort of a thing. Um, and so I started teaching them about snakes. And so of course, when you're sitting around with a bunch of local guys and it's late at night and everyone goes, have you seen the anaconda? I said, no, I haven't seen the anaconda, but I want to see the anaconda because the only thing I'd ever heard about them was that they were giant, <laughs> horrific, terrifying, man-eating dragons. Um, so we started, we started going out, and as, as we were on these hunting trips, I said, guys, if you see an anaconda, let me know. And we started catching anacondas. And yeah, this, this, is, uh, this is the guy who really taught me everything and took me under his wing. And, his name is JJ Juan Julio, and uh, this was the first, I think this one was about 12 feet that we caught, but you gotta be careful when you catch these, because if there's an anaconda on the ground, there is no chance it's gonna bother you. It's just a big anaconda, it's just trying to get the sun, it's trying to, trying to get some heat for the day. But when 18 year old dude from Brooklyn jumps on the anaconda and grabs it by the head, it's gonna wrap around you, because you're essentially, it doesn't know that I'm not hurting it. So this anaconda, when I grabbed him, you know, we wanted to measure him and we wanted to take GPS points on where he was. I was trying to convince people at my school to let me study anacondas, which they said that they talked to the lawyers at the college and they said, no way. Um, <laughs> but at this time, I thought I had a chance of this. Um, so we caught this snake and I, as I got him, he, he went straight around me and, well, first I got him and he wrapped around my, my arms, so my arms are pinned together. So even if I wanted to let him go, I couldn't. And then the next coil came around my shoulders and put my shoulders together. My, my collarbone was just about to crack, and then JJ and the other guys came on and un, unwound him. Um, but I, I heard a few gasps when I put this picture up, and I could, a few people said, this is a big snake. But we showed this snake to JJ's father, who was about 85 years old, and he was one of the toughest guys I've ever met. And he was sitting there, you know, with that unfathomable tough guy thing that the old guys have, and I love it. Um, but he was sitting there and he was like, this is una condita, por qué? This is new. He was like, this is the smallest thing I've ever seen. He's like, you people <laughs> think that you're men? And so he threw down this challenge to us and he said, if you, if you really think you're adventurers, you'll go to the floating forest. And he described a place um, where the local people don't go, where they're scared to go. And so, of course, we went there. Um, and what we found, this is my best sort of notebook sketch of it, but it's, it's a deep lake. It's probably about 35, 40 feet deep in places. And there's all this debris from hundreds and hundreds of years of the jungle just collapsing into this. The jungle's always recycling itself. You, you hear, every time the wind blows, you hear these trees go over, and then there's fungus and mycelium just eating all of that. And the jungle's always recycling itself, growing up and recycling. And so in these lakes, all this stuff falls in. And so when you, when you go to the floating forest, there's just all this stuff and these poles and it's just this black water that goes down into nothing. And when we got there, all the local guys turned around. They're like, we're out, we're done. 
And what I tried to draw there on top is that there's floating vegetation on top of this. There's rafts of floating grass. And we started going out onto the grass, and you like sink and bubble as this happens. And the first night we were out there, we saw the biggest anaconda I've ever seen, which is by all, without any, without any uncertainty, a world record breaker. It was over 25 feet. It was so big that I couldn't get my arms around it. And I got a six foot wingspan. That's a huge snake. I couldn't touch fingers. And I know that because I jumped on it. Um, <laughs> And, and I mean, I just thought, you know, this is going to be the front cover of National Geographic. We got to get a picture of this snake. So I jumped on her and she kept going. And for a while I was riding an anaconda. And I don't expect you to believe that, except for that. I'll tell you this story. And this is that um, JJ and I started bringing, bringing people to the jungle. And, you know, JJ and a lot of his brothers, they're, they used to be loggers. They used to be gold miners. And so well, I said, well, what if... What if you guys, what if you were a cook or a boat driver? Wouldn't it be nicer to just show people the jungle instead of cutting it down? And you're like, yeah, sure, we don't care as long as you pay us. Like, it's, it's, all, it's all good. So we started an ecotourism company. We started pe bringing people down. Pictures like the one I just showed you got us attention. And then, a few years later, I'd been in the Amazon for maybe five years at this point, then National Geographic called up and they said, so this anaconda work you do, they said, could you, you know, could you let us know if you have like a really big one? Because we have a film crew in the area and they'd love to, you know, at that, at that time, I thought, what could be better than being on National Geographic? So I was like really excited about this and I had a group of tourists from around the world and we had this American girl from Florida. She came on a five week expedition because she knew that I worked with anacondas and she said, Paul, the one thing, my one dream, my whole life is to see a huge anaconda. And I said, okay, I said, let's do it. So we, four weeks in, no anacondas, none. And we've been walking through the jungle, living through the jungle, sleeping out there at night and we brought them to the floating forest and we were there four and a half weeks in. It's right at the edge of the trip. Now, I should mention that on this trip, we had this incredibly tough Finnish guy named Jonas, who became a good friend of mine. Um, Jonas is a para jumper and demolitions expert and like a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He's just just super tough guy. Nothing, nothing ruffles this guy. So we're out on the floating forest one day, and the girl, Sarah, you know, she, we went out for our final survey. And we're out there with notebooks and stuff, and we have four weeks of zero data on anacondas and we come back in and everyone's tired, we're wet up to our necks, we've been stung by bees, we're just, you know, it's just, it's also just terrifying, so it's, it takes a lot of stress out of you being on the floating forest. And so I had the whole team together and I was like, all right guys, let's go back. And so it was like a four hour hike back and she just looks at me and she's got, kind of got tears in her eyes and she goes, can we just, can we just split up for a second? Can we just check one more time? And I was like, we checked it. And she goes, please. I said, all right, fine. She goes, well, I want to go out over there alone. And I said, you can't go alone. Uh, and she, she begged me and I was tired, so I said yes. Um, not the best decision. Anyway, everybody went off alone and the dude Jonas goes off alone as well. And I'm standing there because I'm at my wit's end. It's four weeks into an expedition. I've lost 15, 20 pounds and I'm just exhausted. And all of a sudden I hear Jonas and he goes, Paul? And I go, yeah. And I, I can't see him. He's over there. And I go, and I go, what is it? And he goes, I don't know. I'm like, what do you mean you don't know? Then why are you calling my name? So I start like trudging through the floating forest and I'm sinking up. In, and as I get close to him, the tough, one of the toughest guys I've ever known, he turns around to me and his face is so white with a little bit of green. And he's looking at something. And from me to pretty much that wall over there is this anaconda, jet black, dead asleep. And I'm like, oh my God, okay. Front cover National Geographic. We got a whole team here. It's just me and him. Nothing's happening. And I was like, look, what's going to happen is we need to get JJ. We need to get the rest of the team. We can't. And all of a sudden, the snake wakes up. And I just see the black tongue go, whoom, whoom. She smells us. And I was like, all right, so what I'm going to, I'm over here coming up with plans. And Jonas just pops off his shoes because he's ready, because that's the way he is. And so I'm like, all right, one, two. And then all of a sudden, the snake just flexes, like the way you see a croc, like thrash in the water. And the two of us fall back. We're in the water now. And the snake starts going. And in the floating forest, when a snake goes, they go down into the water and they're safe. It's like their home field, man. You just can't catch an anaconda there. And while I'm still trying to put my thoughts together, Jonas goes, he puts his hand on my shoulder and just goes, I trust you! <laughs> and then I got to watch him ride an anaconda. So I've seen two people that have ridden anacondas, but the whole team jumped on this snake and no one was there to take pictures of it, but this is kind of what it looked like. Um, 
And the snake, what happened was actually the snake pulled us down and she grabbed onto a, a branch and there was seven or eight of us and then more people were crashing in and, you know, we pulled and it was like the end of Braveheart. We were like, yeah, one, two, three, pull. And the snake would just pull us in and finally we were like up to our necks in water trying to hold on. And I said, guys, just stop it. I said, just enjoy this moment because no one's ever going to have this experience. And we were all sort of face to face and it was amazing. A few years later, we did get the world record for the largest anaconda caught. And you can see that this one keeps going for quite a ways outside of the picture. She was about 19 feet. And uh, next to the guy in the backwards hat, just to the left, that's Jonas. And he was there on that expedition too. So he got his big one. And uh, there's JJ and me. And at the end, there's my wife. We all, we all, we all brought her up. Um, but a snake like this, the reason that we're studying these snakes is not just to, because it's fun to jump on big snakes. Um, these, these snakes are incredibly important for their ecosystem. So an anaconda of this size, you've got to think, is maybe 40, 50, 70 years old. We really don't know. They have indeterminate growth. Um, by the way, the, the heads of these things, is like, it's like a Rottweiler. Um, but what we started realizing in the Amazon was that as gold miners are coming in, as we're losing habitat, these are the top of the ecosystem. They're the ones regulating. You know, you have fish, you have caiman, you have birds, you have capybara, you have all these other animals. The anacondas are making sure that everything is in balance. And as you have gold mining coming through the Amazon, as you have habitat destruction, apex predators are the ones that are keeping these ecosystems healthy. So as we lose them, we're seeing all kinds of weird changes, just like, you know, like the, the wolves in Yellowstone. They realized when they brought the wolves back that everything else fell into place. So we've been studying the anacondas, trying to, A, teach people that they're not these big, scary monsters, because a lot of the locals will kill them just out of fear. And B, we've just been trying to get people to, real, you know, to understand that species like anacondas, like tigers, like all these, all these apex predators, we tend to think of how dangerous they are, but they're also sort of protecting us because they're keeping our ecosystems and, our, and our, our, our ecosystem services healthy. This is what gold mining looks like in the Amazon. They not only cut down the forest, but then they burn it and then they scrape it aside and they suck up the, the sands to take, to take the gold particles out of, the, out of the soil. So they completely destroy the forest and then they use mercury, which just pollutes everything. So we've been working on this one river, protecting anacondas, protecting everything else. And in this picture, that road showed up in 2009, and two years later, there was just farms, and the, the, the jungle was devastated. And um, how many people, show of hands, were aware of the Amazon fires a few months ago in the news? Yeah. That, um, that's every year in the Amazon we see that. It's, it's really, really scary. It gets worse every year. And but I don't let anybody tell you anything different. It is not natural. I was just actually on, on the news, on an interview yesterday, and somebody goes, but Paul, tell us why. You know, if the Amazon's supposed to burn, it's a natural part of the cycle. And I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, that's California. That's not the Amazon. The Amazon is a rainforest, and it's not supposed to burn. These are human-set fires. And the only way to stop them, because I also spoke to this British billionaire who told me that they were going to send over planes and put out the fires. For the, I said, you can't put out 70,000 intentionally set fires across an area bigger than the continental US. We have to protect the forest, because that's what's sending up the moisture. That's becoming the rain clouds and coming down. And that's what I've been working to do. And so everything I just told you about, that's what Mother of God is about, my first book. And that's what Tamandua Expeditions is about. We bring people down to the jungle to support the local people, to try and make them protectors, to give them the resources to be protectors of their forest, because people need to eat. For all of us, our family comes first, and if you can't provide for your family, you're going to do whatever you have to do. If we support them by traveling to their communities and allow us to show them the treasures that they have in their backyard, we protect the forest. Um, but we'll get back to the Amazon in a little bit. What I'm really here to talk to you about, though, is India. When, when I was in college, uh, a professor said to me, he goes, you know, you, you're over there playing with the local guys in the Amazon, and he goes, you're out there in these pristine ecosystems, and he goes, you, you, you don't understand conservation yet, though. He goes, you haven't been to where there's bigger problems. He goes, in India, all the forest is gone, and there's just little pockets of it left, and he goes, until you see that level, the other side of the story, he goes, you don't know. And I said, I'm not going, I like being in the jungle where you can drink out of the river where there's monkeys swinging from the trees where I don't see another person. I like the wilderness, man. And he was like, yeah, but you're also a hypocrite. He went home and he told me to go on his India study abroad. And I said, no way, I don't want to go to where there's a billion people. Um, 
Well, he came in the next day, and he said, I got two words for you. And I was like, what are they? And he went, tigers and elephants. He said, there's more tigers in India than anywhere else, and there's more Asian elephants in India than anywhere else. And I said, sold for the man with the tigers and the elephants. And I went to India on a study abroad, and it absolutely changed my life. In India, I never even thought of India. Honestly, since I saw Jungle Book when I was a kid, and I, I didn't even know that it was supposed to be in India, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> you're like a little kid, you don't know. But I mean, you go there, and there's, this is where you find peacocks. This is where you have snake charmers and spectacle cobras, and they're king cobras. This is where you have bear cocks. Has anybody ever seen one? <laughs> yeah. I'm just making sure you're awake, making sure, just making sure. I don't know why I'm like this. Um, <laughs> they also have, and one of the first and scariest encounters I had in the Indian jungle was bison. They have, this is the largest extent, the largest living bovine species. They stand seven feet at the shoulder. So actually, they're about this size. They're terrifying, and, and they're so big that their skull, when you stand up their skull, their skull is about this big, and it's, it's just so massive, and they have, they're like bodybuilders. They just have unreasonable amounts of muscle all over them, which makes it that much more terrifying that a tiger can take one of those down alone. When you see lions hunting, you always see like a whole pride of lionesses going after something and they're all pulling on its nose and pulling on its leg and of course they get it down. A tiger has to take that on alone. And by the way, let's just clear this up right now. Don't ever let anyone tell you that the lion is the king of the jungle. Lions live in the savanna. Tigers live in the jungle. Lion, tigers are the king of the jungle. I'm just, you, heard it, you heard it here first. Um, <laughs> But tigers, tigers inspired me so much, and I honestly think that when I started this journey, I had no idea what a tiger is. And I think that most of us have it like that. Um, for one thing, I thought tigers, when I thought of a tiger, I thought of kind of like a, like a large dog, like a St. Bernard. I don't know, I just, I just did I never thought of it, but, you know, I was imagining something like this. This is a six-month-old cub. This is a baby tiger, which is why we could play like this. Um... This is a fully grown tiger, and his head was so much bigger than my head, and his chest was so much bigger than my chest, and he weighed 600 pounds and had dinner plate-sized paws, and this is the only picture out of, I had a professional photographer with me, and he was going, brrrr, brrrr, brrr, and he, he came over to me, and he goes, man, he goes, I've shot you with king cobras, I've shot you with anacondas, and he goes, you look scared. He's like, you gotta stop looking scared. <laughs> this is the only picture, because this was right before I pushed him away and fell over backwards. I, tigers tigers are, are, are on such a different level than us. They're so powerful. Their forearms are so thick. They're just, they're just you know, if, if you take, in the rocks, paper, scissor game of wildlife, there's nothing that beats tiger. Not grizzly bear. Not, no other terrestrial animal beats tiger. They're so huge. I mean, you're talking about, you know, seven or eight feet long, 600 pounds. They have a 20-foot vertical leap. Even their tongues are covered in spikes. Even their tongues are dangerous. They literally have like shark teeth on their tongues and they can lick your skin right off. After I was playing with that cub, I was missing most of the skin on my arms and then, well, I also had the, um, the incident where one cub bit straight through my hand, which he was just playing, you know, like the way you play with a dog, you're like, give me the frisbee, give me the frisbee. Well, I was, I, I was my first day interacting with tigers and he bit straight through my hand and then I passed out. Um, <laughs> but aside from being physically just incredible. I mean, for, for a tiger, put a tiger and a person in a room, there's no universe, you know, if they're fighting to the death, there's no universe where the human can in any way even hurt the tiger. For a tiger, killing a person's like, for us, stepping on a banana. It's like, it's that easy. Like, I was going to say fighting a baby, but that's weird. Um, <laughs> but, but the thing with tigers is the story. Um, I, I forget what year it was that the, the you know, the poem Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. I, I believe it was the 1790s that that was written. And at that time, there was 100,000 tigers in the world. And just like I was talking about with anacondas, these animals are shaping the world that we grew up in. 
So someone very wise once told me that the elephants made the world. They, they raised us as a species. And I said, what do you mean they raised us as a species? And he said, think about this. He said, the elephants are carrying seeds all over the forest. The elephants are pulling down trees and gardening everything. And they said that then, you know, you have the deer and they're grazing everything. But again, you have to keep all of this in balance. Tigers. So these animals, 10,000 years ago, you know, we had all this Pleistocene megafauna. Um, there were actually something like 22 species of proboscis animals. We had all different types of elephants with tusks coming out all kinds of weird places. And now we only have a few left. But they, they are such an influence of the ecosystems that we grew up in and that we were cutting down. I mean, we cut down 95% of the forest that was in the U.S., to build our industries, to build our societies, to make ships. I mean, everything we have at the end of the day starts with ecosystems. And these animals are the ones that did it. So that what he told me about that they raised us as a species, that stayed with me. And with tigers, it's just devastating because from 100,000, you have such massive declines till today. But in terms of talking about what a tiger truly is, there's one story that I must tell you. I'm already running out of time. Um, but if you're in the jungle and you see this, you're good. I know a lot of tiger scientists and they say when they see a tiger, they stand there and they, you know, they look at it, they take a picture, they make a note, whatever it is. But you're not in any danger because a tiger is interested in hunting deer. A tiger is interested in you know, getting sun, getting water. They don't care about us. In fact, like most cats, when you see a tiger, usually they're just like, ew. They're just, ugh. They're just like, go away. Um, they don't bother people. There is one area in India called the Sundarbans. It's on the India-Bangladeshi border, and there the, the tigers rut routinely eat people, but that's a weird freak thing that's on its own. But most other places, tigers don't eat people. So it was very strange. At the turn of the century, we're talking 1900, there was a tiger in Nepal, and she started eating people. And you figure a tiger, we know now, a tiger eats about a deer a week, and a deer weighs a little bit more than a person. So da -da -da -da. after her first year, she'd eaten about 100 people. And the British were there, so they were, you know, they keeping notes of everything, of course. And um, so she ate about 100 people. And then when she got up to about 150, they brought in hunters, and they tried to get her for a few months, and nobody could bring down this tigress. And it started to get almost like ghost-like, where they were like, where is she? We're going through the forest, and every time we, we, we you know, point our gun somewhere, she's not there. This tiger knew what was going on. That's how smart they are. You, most of us don't, mo there's, a, there's a book out right now called Are We Smart Enough to Understand How Smart Ele Animals Are? Something like that. They might have used the word intelligent, though. Um, but they couldn't catch this tiger no matter what they did. Snares, poison, hunters, nothing would get this tiger. So what, eventually what they did was they got everybody together, they got 300 people, and they burned down the whole forest. Tiger knew that was coming too, and she crossed over into India. And the villagers there had no idea, and you have you know, these very small, emaciated, rural Indians working out in the field. So once a week, she'd go to the, the farmer's side, well, the farmer's market for humans, and she'd grab a person, and she'd eat them. And so after another year, she'd tallied another 100 persons. So now she's up to 300 people, this one tiger, because this has been going on so long. And so they brought in like the expert hunters, the best guys in the world. And here's the thing, only one guy got sights on her and he got his gun out. And she actually at the time, I think they said, had, had grabbed a woman by the center and just picked her up and was walking with her. And the woman was like kicking and screaming. And this tiger just, the guy put up his gun and the tiger put, dropped the woman and just looked back at him like, yes. And the guy threw his gun on the ground and ran away because he knows he was an experienced hunter and he knew that if you shoot a bear, it's gonna go, ah, and it's gonna run. You shoot a tiger, you don't kill it. It's gonna come back and finish you off right there and then. Tigers, tigers understand vengeance. So this guy threw his gun. So then they brought in the best of the best. They brought this guy, Jim Corbett, who was known for, whenever there's a problem tiger, he would come in and take care of the problem. So he came in and he got 300 people together and they got a whole team of elephants and they did this, you know, this huge shikari hunt where they went and they, they brought everything in with drums and torches and elephants and they were lighting things on fire and shooting guns in the air and they brought her into a choke point where he was waiting. So when she came through the doors, he shot her and brought her down. Turns out, this was the tigress, by the way. True story. Um, the only reason she was hunting people was because when she was a cub, she got shot and took out all of her front canines and she couldn't hunt normal prey. So she had to go for the easiest thing, which was us, because we're slow and soft. Um, but that incident made this guy think. 
And he was also alive at a time where he was really seeing the drop off in tigers. And Jim Corbett, who went from being a tiger hunter, became one of the biggest tiger conservationists because he was alive at that time. And he said, if we keep going at this rate, he goes, there's going to be no tigers left. And there's actually a, a, a national park in India named Jim Corbett National Park. And soon after this, in the next few decades, you had sport hunting where people would go to India and hire a guide and they'd go out and blow away a family of tigers. He even had Hollywood actors doing it. This guy made his Rolls Royce with a machine gun on the back. It was his tiger killing mobile. It was like a whole fun thing for people. In China, they were exterminating tigers because they thought, why do we need them? They're just big scary things that eat our deer. Um, and so what you had was, you have all of this was tiger range. All of this orange was, was the historical tiger range. And then the little flecks of orange that are there today that's not where tigers are. That's where tigers could be. There's only something like 3,000 tigers left. So from 100,000 tigers down to 3,000 tigers. We have lost so much of the tiger population that they're at risk of going extinct. And what, what's really, really sort of mind-numbing about it is that you know, they're not in one spot. They're spread out across 11 countries. So you had tigers in the Middle East. You had the Caspian tiger as far as Turkey. Uh, up until 1997, there were still Caspian tigers in Turkey. I think they killed the last one in 1997. They were bigger than Siberian tigers. We've lost that species. They are extinct. We had, what was the other one? We had several other species of tigers that are already gone. But we have now all across India, Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Sumatra, but in a lot of these countries, there's, just, there's a, just a few tigers. And in most of these countries, you saw those little flecks of orange on, on the range map. They're, they're, they're migrating between these islands, these islands of forest. So if I'm a tiger and I'm in this forest and I have to migrate to the next forest, there's 100,000 people living between here and there. And there's roads and dogs, because the dogs will bark and let everybody know that you're there. Villages, I mean, there's just, it's just, there's humans everywhere. It's India or in, in, in any of these Asian countries, there's so many people. So these tigers are ending up more and more in villages. And this picture was very influential to me. So I went on that India study abroad and I started following tigers. I started going to the range areas where there's the borderlands between the national parks because, yeah, there's, national, there's tigers in the national parks. That's, that's fine for me. But a national park is a little bit like a fishbowl, like a terrarium. It's like a planned area where we're saying, okay, there's animals here and there's not animals over here, but they're not, wi they're not necessarily wild anymore. What I'm interested in is how the tigers are getting from one national park through the parking lots and stores and streets and dogs and people and chai shops to the next national park. And so I started doing this and me and my wife would go on these road trips and I remember the first time I found a tiger footprint. I'd already spent three years or something in India I met my wife in India on the study abroad, so that, that's a whole other story. But, um, but I'd been living in India for almost three years when I found my first tiger print, and it, like, I might as well have found a dragon egg. I like, fell to my knees, and I looked at it, and it was way bigger than a leopard print, and I'm, I'm a decent tracker. I just, it was a tiger print, and it was like a magical thing. It was like a major moment in my life, just seeing the impression in the earth where this thing had been, because there's only 3,500 of them left. This tiger's name is Kala. Kala fell into a well in central India. She was migrating between things and she was living on the fringes. And they have these big deep wells in India. They'll dig a huge open circle, like 20 feet across and go down like 30, 40 feet or, or 60 feet. And she somehow fell in there and couldn't get out. So the villagers woke up in the morning and they threw the water bucket down into the well and there's a tiger. So they threw nets down there and they were trying to help her up and she was snarling and she was scared and you can see she's knocked some of the skin off of her face. She was injuring herself trying to, trying to get out of this well. Of course, it's sheer brick walls. There's no way a tiger can climb that. They called in the forest department and they took her out. They tranquilized her. They lifted her out and they kept her for two months and they put a radio collar on her. When they released her, after they named her Kala, she taught us everything because we'd never before known that there were tigers right in our backyards in India. There's tigers moving. There's literally farm fields and in, in, the, in the bushes and in like the, 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 the eucalyptus trees over there. Kala would go and bed down in the bushes for the day. She'd let the sun go over, she'd let the workers go by, whatever else. And then at night, she'd be up and she'd move 20 miles at night. And she'd, she'd grab herself a dog, she'd grab herself a goat. Tigers have actually been a, 
observed mimicking dog whining sounds. Like, and the dogs will come over with the ears out and they'll be like, Ooh, what's that? And it's like, Grr. and that's that. And they actually, also they know how to slap kill, which is where you just hit the thing so hard that its neck breaks. No sound, no blood, nice and easy. Um, but Kala taught us all of this because she, she was just going through all these different protected areas. And really, she, they said like she became the face of modern-day tigers. And this picture, the rage in her eyes, that spirit that's in her, um, that, that, that stayed with me as I was going through South India. And, it, and at, at this point that I had seen this, I had, I had spent years and years and years going after this, this goal of mine, which was to see a wild tiger on foot in the forest, you know. And uh, it wasn't happening. And it, was, it really started to sink into me how rare and how elusive these cats are. This is, this is a tiger named Avni. She was, uh, she was in also central India, and just a few months ago they killed her because she was a suspected man-eater. They never proved that she was a man-eater, but someone accused her of being a, a man-eater, and of course a tiger can't uh, really defend themselves against what somebody says, so they killed her. Those are her cubs that we think are still out there, but she was another one just like Kala, sort of a wayfaring tigress that, that this one didn't make it, but we have her on camera traps. Um, now, when you go through a South Asian jungle, the, the, I guess you could say the, the undeniable force is the elephants. Because I would go out for tigers, but the elephants are the ones, you know, an elephant, first of all, they don't really have natural predators. A tiger can't take down an elephant. They're so big that a tiger can't open its mouth big enough. So an elephant really only has to worry about us. And they're so smart, and they have such incredibly close family bonds that when we're building roads and we're infringing on their habitat, you know, they got to move. They have centuries-old maps in their heads that they follow, that their grand grandparents, grandparents, grandparents did. They, they know the bones of their ancestors. They know the watering holes. They know things that we can't even imagine. I've lived with a herd of elephants. I've negotiated with elephants, and believe me, we don't win. Um, but stuff like this is heartbreaking because you have them trying to get past us, and, and we're everywhere. Um, this, this was a boy in one of the tribal communities. So in the Amazon, I work with JJ and the indigenous people there. Well, in India, the Kuruba tribe is known for being honey collectors. So this, this, this kid and a lot of his friends, they'll go up into the canopy of the rainforest. We're talking about like 120 feet up on these ancient trees with machetes in their mouths walking barefoot on tree branches like it's straight out of Jungle Book. Um, and they'll, you know, they'll cut fruits and they'll throw it down and they have, they have elephants on the ground to pick them up. But he works with the elephants every day. The other thing is, we have tractors and backhoes. When trees go down over a road, they call this kid. So I met him, and he, I don't know how old he is, he's like 11 or something. He rode in on the back of his elephant. He like comes in like he's the coolest thing in the world. He's like smoking a cigarette and he threw it. And he gets down and we're like, we, you know, I asked my wife to translate and she was like, hey, you know, hey, hey kid. She's like, what are you, you know, where are your parents? <laughs> like, what are you doing with this elephant? And he was like, parents. He's like, I don't have a parent. And he was like, roll over. And the elephant rolls over. And he starts washing the elephant. He goes, I don't have parents. He goes, I'm an orphan. He goes, do you want to hire my elephant? And we were like, no, we don't need your elephant services. But, <laughs> but he, this kid and this elephant live together in the jungle. That they're each other's family. And uh, there's sort of this whole group of lost boys that has elephants. And, and I mean, there's one kid that had an elephant that was completely blind. The, the elephant had been blinded by another elephant. And so the boy would tell him, left, right, yes, no, yeah, pick that up, pick that up. Yeah, like, and the elephant would listen to everything with his trunk. This, uh, well, this is, this, is, this is Ramachandran. This is the, the biggest elephant in captivity in India. And he's, well, he doesn't like being in captivity. He's, he's killed something like four trainers, three cows, and two other elephants. He's, he's been trying to get free his whole life, but he's, he's been kept captive. Where, so, whereas that boy and his elephant, you know, his elephant's not wild, but it's not being abused like a circus elephant or something, or like this guy is. This guy is under chains. This guy is abused, and, and, and he's full of rage because of it. Um, now, elephant rage, if, you, if you're out in a jungle... Now, obviously, a, a tiger, I said a tiger's not going to bother you. The only animal in the Indian jungle that I'm truly scared of is a sloth bear because they're not always rational. A bear will bury its head in an ant nest, and then if you scare it, it'll turn around and get scared and kill you because he's scared. Um, I, I, have, I want nothing to do with that. Um, I'm fine with the snakes. I understand them. But 
you look at how big, and actually what's funny is that as big as this is projected here, he's way bigger than this in real life. This, this guy is just so monstrous that you can't believe it. And I learned the power of a tiger. I, don't, I have this thing called the wet paint principle, and that is my idiotic tendency of when it says, oh, it says wet paint over there, I go, yeah, it is, it's wet. I don't know why I do that, but I have to be, I have to have things proved to me. Um, and so everyone was telling me, be careful with the elephants, be careful with the elephants, they're so dangerous. I said, they're elephants, they're herbivores, why would they, why would they bother us? Well, the thing is, these elephants go into farms because the forest is small and there's not a lot of food left. So they go into farms, and one guy I know, an elephant ate $20,000 worth of his banana crop in one night. So what do these people do? Again, they, they, throw, they, throw, they shoot fireworks at them, they shoot them with guns, they, they make like little flame balls and they throw them at them, they try to electrocute them. But what happens is, from the time an elephant is a little calf, she sees her parents terrified of the human, oh, the humans are coming, the humans are coming, let's go. And she sees then, I'm sure the first time she has something thrown at her, or she gets shot and then she gets an infection and she has to deal with that while she's living in the wild. So elephants learn their whole lives that these horrible little upright apes are terrible. And so they learn to really, really hate us. Uh, fair enough, you know, that's what I'm saying. Um, so when you're out in, Indi in the Indian jungle, you have to be very, very careful because elephants will kill you. And this one morning, um, I was sitting with a friend having, having coffee, and she told me, she says, you have to be so, so careful. She goes, my neighbor was in a two-year battle with this elephant where they were going back and forth, and he kept, you know, the elephant kept stealing his crops, and he kept shooting at this elephant, and da 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 Finally, the elephant just said, enough of this. He goes, I really want those bananas. And he came in, and he waited there in the bushes. And when the guy woke up in the morning, he grabbed the guy by both ankles and just, poof, just broke him against the ground, and the guy died. And she was just like, you have to be so careful. Later that same day, I saw a herd of elephants over there, and I was out by myself, and I had my notebook, and I had this wonderful idea in my head where I was like, I'm going to be like an author, and I'm going to sit, and I'm going to draw these elephants, and it's going to be so exciting. And I'm looking over there at the elephants, and I completely forgot to look at what was in front of me. So as I'm walking, there's forest all around me, and just right here, it goes down, there's maybe a 12-foot drop down to this stream, and then there's a big trench, and the elephants were over there. So I said, I'm safe. I'm totally good. I'm being responsible. And I walked, and for a while, the trail went away from the stream. And I looked up at one point, and there was this gigantic rump of a male elephant, and he sort of, with the huge tusks and everything, he just looked at me, and he just went, what? Like, I was standing right here, and you could just tell he was just like, you know, like when a fly lands on your food, and you're like, no! Well, he turned around, and he broke a tree in half with his, tr with his tusks, and he went, Boo! so loud that my feet folded. I just, like, hit the ground. I had to cover my ears. That was the most important thing. And then he started charging at me, and I ran as fast as I could. I ran for my life, and I've handled venomous snakes, and I've done all this stuff. This was the most danger I'd ever been in. And I literally looked over my shoulder and saw trees coming apart, and I saw him running through the jungle, breaking everything as he went. And of course, as I ran through the jungle, you get stuck in thorn bushes, you hit into trees, you trip over vines, everything. So when I got to the edge of that stream, I just threw myself over and went tumbling down the 12 feet and hit the water. And when he got to the edge, he gets to the edge of the thing, and the elephant goes like this like he's going to fall over, which would have, he probably would have broken his own neck and killed me all in one shot, but thankfully he didn't do that. So I'm laying there on the ground, and I was like, ah, I'm alive, and he took a stick and he threw it at me. <laughs> and I, yeah, it was, it was, it was insanity, and so naturally the next thing I did when I realized I was alive was start taking selfies. Um, <laughs> Um, that's the closest I ever came to dying, man. He came so, so close to getting me. If I had just tripped over one more vine, he would have just gone, and that would have been the end of that. I just got, this was just a cut from a, from a whatever, but I sent that to my mom, and I was like, Ma, look! She doesn't care anymore. She was like, you're obviously fine if you're sending it to me. I was like, all right. It lo it's, not, it's not as exciting if you don't get the reaction out of them. Um, yeah, but these are, these are just other pictures of the boys working with the elephants. So this was one guy... This is actually, this elephant's missing one eye and one tusk from a, from a fight. And uh, they let him free in the day, but then he comes back and, you know, they work together and stuff. And they just have this amazing bond. So in this picture, I sat with them for a whole afternoon, and there were boys up in the trees and the elephants down on the ground, and it was, it was quite something to watch them work. They have a very, very close relationship, the humans and the elephants that work with them. So again, there's wild elephants. The way I see it, there's three groups. There's the wild elephants. There's the elephants that live in the jungle but work with the people and have, have some freedom and get to be in their natural environment and have a good, still have a good life. 
And then there's like the incarcerated elephants like Ramachandran, like circus elephants that have this horrible life that, where they're isolated from other, other elephants. Um, but the tribal people in India also are under tremendous strain. And I'm not going to get too much into it because it's not as strict of a wildlife issue, but, you know, society has cut back the forest to the point where there's just these little bits of forest. And so now the, the conservationists come in and we're like, yo, we, we have to have tigers living here because this is the only forest left. We got we to gotta have all the people out of here. Well, the thing is, these people have been living in the forest for generations and generations. And I've seen what it looks like when they live in the forest, both top photos. And I've seen what it's like when people forcibly rip them out of the forest and stick them in government issue homes on the side of a hill with no forest. And it's devastating because they don't know how to get a job. They know everything about the medicinal plants and where to find food and the animals and all of that incredible knowledge that we don't have. But when you rip them out of the forest, it's devastating for them. Um, now, snakes have given me everything good in my life. I will never understand why people are scared of snakes. I, when I was a little kid, catching snakes taught me so, looking for snakes in the woods caught me, taught me so much. Um, Steve Irwin, I was going to go work at Steve Irwin's zoo before he died. I met my wife because a snake brought us together in the middle. Um, JJ I met because I could, I could teach him about snakes and that gave me access to the whole Amazon. So I have to just show you this amazing, amazing, amazing video. Um, just a few months ago we were out in the field and I was with a Nat Geo photographer named Trevor Frost and this co king cobra, an 11 foot king cobra came into a village and we got the call. We were doing snake rescues and we went to this call and we we're trying to figure out what the, what the problem was. Turns out when king cobras come into a village, a lot of times it's because the forest is very dry and people keep finding them in bathrooms. They want water. They're just coming for a drink. So this is like an 11 foot long, you know, if it bites you, you die instantly sort of thing. And the, the, the guy who was there with us was he's like, no, 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 this guy, he's just very, he is very thirsty. He was saying he's very, very thirsty. So we, we gave him a drink and look, you, I don't know if you've ever seen a snake drink before. But what, a, what an adorable little thing, right? <laughs> no, but I mean that. Look at him. I mean, he's, he's, he's hooded up here, and he's saying, look, you don't mess with me. I'm not going to do anything, but stay back. You know, just like a rattlesnake. They're just saying, look, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> if you want to die, take another step. But no, I was very, that, that, that king cobra was, was just something special. Um, now, stay with me. Bear with me for a second. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip you back to the Amazon for a second. So I told you how we run an ecotourism company, and I work with the local people. So I have people come from all over the world. Jonas brought his, his special forces friends, and they said, we want to go on an expedition. And I took them, I hammered them out there, and I brought them on the most intense week-long jungle trip. Everybody lost like 20 pounds. It was devastating. Um, but in like 2012, I was, I was in the Amazon, and this family came from India. And it was mom, dad, two girls, Anya and Isha. And Isha was the younger one. And uh, most people, they come to the jungle and I spend my entire time helping them with what shoes to wear and telling them they don't need to be scared and, you know, teaching them how to... This little kid, Isha, 11 years old, she was so ready to go. She, she, was, she was so connected to every animal. She's going, that's a macaw, that's a this. 11 years old, she'd already studied all the animals. And I was just like, this is, this is special. And then... You know, all of us adults, in our kitchen area, we have screens, and there's all these butterflies that go on these screens, and they all die, and there's a pile of dead butterflies underneath the windows. But she would be in there every day with a cup, rescuing the butterflies. And at first, you know, I smiled, but then I was like, you know, that's kind of nice. I was like, it's nice that she does that. And then I started helping her to rescue the butterflies. And then uh, even when I killed a mosquito, I'd kill a mosquito, and she'd, she'd look at me, and she'd go, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? It was biting me. And she goes, no, no, no. She goes, you're supposed to be the protector of the animals. She goes, you can't kill a mosquito. You know, and then she'd, she'd back it up with a whole, whole, you know, theology that she had. But at 11 years old, she had such a deep connection to animals. And catching snakes and doing all this other stuff um, really just, you know, sort of proved herself in the jungle. Also things like, which I identified as, as a, as a rebellious terrible student when I was a kid. I, I didn't like to listen to any rules. And one day I was up about 30 feet up in a tree with her and the river was underneath her. And she goes, can I jump? I said, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know. I said, ask your parents. She goes, mom, dad. She goes, can I jump? And they were like, no. We we're like, look how far it is. They were like, you're this big. And she just, she started crying. And she was like, I should be allowed to jump. I know I could do it. She looked at me and she goes, I'm jumping. 
She goes, <laughs> and I just went, okay. I mean, the last person who's going to give you parental, you know, adult guidance is me. I was like, cool. I was like, I'm a lifeguard. I'll come with you. And so she jumped and I jumped and whatever. But it was like she just, nothing would stop her. And the thing, the icing on the cake, though, was that this little kid, when we were leaving the last day, we were out, we had to go to, you know, you have to go actually to that road I showed you. And there's a logging village there. And the people have, you know, that you see people coming in with monkeys and macaws and endangered species. And these guys came in with these tortoises that they had, bundled up and that they were going to throw into the soup pot. And as a conservationist, you have to develop a certain amount of like heart callus. You have to get used to seeing people, you know, shoot monkeys and do whatever. I mean, that's just the way it is out there. The Isha looked at these tortoises and instantly started crying. And she was like, she looks, she goes, how old do you think those tortoises are? And I said, I don't know, like, it's probably like 70 years old. And, you know, it was very sad, whatever. But, but again, again, I'm like an adult. I'm like, I don't worry about the car. And you know, I was like, yeah, I've seen tortoises before. And you, you can't buy them because then it encourages like the trade in endangered species. But she wasn't con con confused with all that stuff. She just was like, yeah, but these tortoises, what's going to happen to these tortoises? They're going to die. And I said, yeah. And even as I said it, I was like, oh, God. And she was like, well, you, you're going you're to let that happen? And I was like, no, I guess not. I guess I'm not going to let this happen. But she had that thing. And so, of course, I went up to the, the, the guys and I said, can I to have your tortoise. <laughs> the guy was like, what do you want it for? He goes, you don't even know how to cook it. And then I was like, oh God. I was like, I'm not going to cook it. And he goes, what do you want it for? Then I was like, I, I couldn't even explain to these people, but I bought two tortoises and we took them and we released them somewhere else. But she had that ability to, to with me at least, to change people to, to that, sort of, that sort of passion and that sort of un, un, unbreakable bearing of I know what's right and this is the way I feel. And that's a very, very powerful thing. Um, now, a few years later, maybe like three years later, the, that whole family, they went back to India where they live, and I, I kept in touch with, with uh, Isha. And like three years later, I get an email from her. And the email is titled, I have a question about a tigress. And I open the email, and it's 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm in the Amazon. She's in India. And her questions are very direct. A mother tiger's gone missing. I need to know what to feed the cubs. I need to know where to bring them. No one else is doing anything. I'm going to go save them. 15 years old. She says she's going to go rescue tigers. Now, I went off on a six-week expedition into the Amazon, and I, I couldn't really, I mean, I told her what to do, and sort of just said, oh, God, because I knew her, and I knew that she'd probably do it. But what I'm trying to do this whole time, hold on, I'm going to come to the front and get it. <laughs> Um, what I'm trying to do by telling you all these different sort of random stories is connect you to actually all of the characters in The Girl and the Tiger. Because through my journey through India, you know, Thimma is, a, is, a, is one of the characters in this book. Isha and her tiger, Kala. These are, you know, people, I was just doing an interview this morning and they said, okay, so this book is fiction, right? So your first book really happened to you and this book you made up. And I was like, ah! I was like, I don't know if you could say that I made it up because, because, Really, when my friends read it, they're like, oh, I remember that. Oh, I remember that. I remember that. They, it, this, this book came from very, very real experiences. Um, and in terms of, like I was saying, like, like a tiger, you know, people say she's a man-eater. Well, a tiger can't really argue with us, can she? She can't, she can't file a complaint. She can't take it to social media. She can't protest it. And the same thing with ecosystems. When we bulldoze a forest, the animals don't get to speak up about it. We talk about, is it good for climate change? Is it good for, like, you know, our own stuff? We never, so many people always leave out the fact that these animals have their own reasons for living and they're part of an ecosystem and we don't get to just destroy those things. And so after living with the animals for so many years, I truly feel like that this is the story that they'd want me to tell. This, this book is my best shot. You know, in the Amazon now, I have rangers. Actually, just this morning, I dispatched the Peruvian Navy to go take out some people that are cutting down forests. We're doing, you know, serious conservation work. But along with that, I feel like telling a story to bring people in. Because if you tell people, you know, oh, there's 500 tigers living in this region, and most people aren't going to, it's not going to hit them, like, really on an emotional level. And I wanted to tell a story that would actually bring people into the minds of animals, actually let people truly know on a more emotional level what this story means. What is it like 120 years after Jungle Book? You know, in Jungle Book, the tiger was the bad guy, and there was jungle everywhere, and it was this one dynamic. Well, now, all these years later, there's hardly any jungle left. Tigers are refugees, and it's a totally different situation. And so, really, the reason I'm here talking to you tonight and the reason I'm telling you all these stories is because a lot of my best friends are animals. 
and I, I, I think that they'd want me here, um, you know, trying to make as much noise as I could. He, he wanted my notebook on this day, and you see when I yell at him, I give him one more chance, and when I go, stop it, and you see him, he wags his ears, and he, he holds his trunk in his mouth. Baby. He gets so, he gets so upset. What's, what are you going to do with the notebook, man? Um, yeah, he was a sweetheart, but he's, you know, again, that's, that's one of the, that's, that's one of my, one of the guys that taught me a lot about the Indian jungle. I'm going to, I'm going to shut up for a second, and I, I put together just like a little bit of a, sort of like if the girl and the tiger had a movie trailer, this would be it. Um, so I'm just going to play you some footage, and then I just have a few things to wrap up, and then I will, uh, I'll stop. But here we go. We all knew that they would say it was just a legend, like it was one of the old stories. But this happened in our time. You see how past the villages, there's still magic out there. In the last scraps of jungle, where the old ways still survive. It's the story that the animals asked me to tell. One that would have been lost if it wasn't for the memory of those of us who had been there to see it for ourselves. They'd say a legend of stripes and fire that came to be known as the girl and the tiger. So that's uh, just some of the footage that I've shot over the years that I just stuck together. And you saw that scene where the elephant lifts the truck up and is throwing it. That was a temple elephant, just like Ramachandran, that decided he, he had enough. Um, but but those are, that was all. Writing this book was a very interesting experience because it was really just taking all of these things that I've seen and sort of putting it into something that could bring try to bring people into that space with me. This This photo was the... This photo is the front cover of the U.S. copy, and it took me six years, but I did finally get to stand in the forest with a tiger, and this isn't my photo, because I didn't take a photo, because I wanted to just enjoy the moment. But this is kind of what it looked like. And I don't even tell that story, because that's between me and the forest and the tiger. Um, but there's so few of them left, and telling this story is, is so important to me. For the last tigers, for the elephant herd, for the wild creatures who made our world. And I actually got real life Isha to draw me the, uh, the elephant, because she does Indian henna art. The book is out in the US. This is the US cover with Owl Hollow Press. It's coming out in Penguin Random House in India in a few months. And somehow Slash from Guns N' Roses loves wildlife, and he gave us his endorsement, which is really exciting. Um, <laughs> the man loves his animals. And Steve Winter from National Geographic. And I just, you know, I think that the thing I want to end on, though, and especially because we have so many young people tonight, is that, A, look at, you know, that little girl Greta who's going around now talking about the climate. Look at what she's doing. Look at what Isha did to me and to everyone else. Now, how many millions of people are going to read this book and, and maybe be inspired to protect wildlife? And I know that what I talk about, you know, it's always, well, the forest is disappearing, the ecosystem is disappearing, there's less tigers, less elephants. But there's also a lot of good work being done. And that's what nobody told me when I was a kid, and that's what kept me up at night. But humpback whales are coming back. They're off the endangered species list. Bald eagles, elk are back into the Great Smoky National Forest. 
actually, to India, India just doubled its tiger population. There's like really good work going on right now. And like at this point, when I work out in these places, like I'm actually seeing people wake up where the, the coastal fishermen in India, they had these big trawlers coming in. They actually said, well, look what happened in Africa. They said they literally killed the ecosystem. We'd rather make a little bit of sustainable income than have these giant corporations come in. And they just said no. And I feel like us as a generation, as a global society, the people that are alive right now, this is undeniably the most important moment in history, all of history. I mean, I grew up with the World War II generation, all my uncles and, and my grandparents, they were, they were all out on the beaches in, in Europe and Southeast Asia, but this is bigger than that because we're at the point where the Amazon is starting to burn. We're at the point where we're losing species like tigers. If you can't save tigers, then what, what, what do you have, you know? If you save tigers, you save everything else. And so you guys who are in the audience, you came here tonight to hear about wildlife. I hope that some of you guys are going to be the next generations of people studying and protecting these things. And don't think that what you do doesn't have an effect, because it does. Um, I, think, I think that I just covered pretty much everything I wanted to say. I do have one request for you guys. And that is, as I say goodnight, would you guys just say hello to everybody on the internet? Because I would love to post this to Instagram and just say hello. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you for coming. Good night. Okay. Got camera shy. <laughs> right, and if anybody has questions, please raise your hand. I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Mic check. Okay. Anyway. Since tigers have become endangered and a lot of people are actually breeding them in zoos and inbreeding has become a problem over time, especially with white tigers, what do you think people should and can do to prevent that? Uh, yeah, so your question is, uh, should, should we be preventing the breeding of tigers? Yeah, I mean, in captivity, the problem is, is when a mother tiger teaches her babies about how to hunt, they know how to hunt. If the mother tiger dies, those babies can never live in the wild. Never. No one has ever successfully rehabilitated a tiger. If you take a deer and you raise it and you release it, it's going to chew on the grass. It's going to live. Tigers have a very complex set of skills that they have to learn from their parents, from their mother. And once that's broken, I mean, they actually have sort of culture. Some tigers chase their prey into water. Some tigers have different, you know, into different things. They do hamstringing where they cut the back leg. So the, the thing with captive breeding is that they can, they can do it. I mean, the thing is for me, I, I care that the tiger, I mean, my, my, my job is to protect wild spaces. I don't, I don't really usually deal with animal rights, but obviously I want the tigers treated well. If there's big enclosures and if they're treated well, fine. But like you said, to produce white tigers, a lot of times they, they think they genetically, they have to breed a lot of them to get white tigers. And also most facilities don't treat the tigers well. I mean, we, the thing is, a, a captive tiger is kind of a, a ghost. It's a pointless tiger. It's something we can look at. And yes, having tigers, there's a big anti-zoo movement right now where people are saying you shouldn't have animals in zoos. They're trying to get the elephant out of the Bronx Zoo. Um, I'm not with that. I mean, if I, if I didn't have the experiences I had at the zoo when I was a kid, I, probably, I might not be doing what I'm doing now. And I'm protecting more acres of rainforest, which means more animals than almost ever anyone I know. There's some people that I really look up to who are protecting way more. But um, no, I think that zoos are very important. But yeah, captive breeding of tigers, it's just, you know, it, I just don't think it's very, very important. Maybe one or two places could do it so we have them in zoos, but it shouldn't really be, be allowed, no. Anybody else? Um, it's, it's like, it's fun. It's a cool idea. Believe me, no one, I mean, I would be the first person in line to see a woolly mammoth. I would be so excited about that. But really, um, there's a few things like Mars. Elon Musk is like, oh, we got to go to Mars. No, we don't. There's no ecosystem on Mars. What do we got to go to Mars for? That's just a stupid publicity stunt. And I think that with this cloning thing, I think that they're making a big buzz about the cloning because they want to play cloning. These are 
scientists that want to just do this, so far no one's done it. They haven't brought back any species. And bringing back a woolly mammoth, if you bring it back, then are you going to give it habitat and give it the tundra back? You know, it's like, is there even a place for these animals? And certainly with tigers and stuff, I, I just don't think it's realistic. I think that that's us being a little bit, a little bit cavalier with our idea of how smart we are. I just, I'll believe it when I see it. Sir? Oh, yeah. Sure. So if anybody didn't hear his question was about like the ivory trade and, and all of that stuff and, and how basically that little kid would be pretty easy to knock off if you were an ivory poacher. But that's mostly in Africa with the African elephants. In South India, it's pretty tame. Whereas in North India, they share a border with China. So you have the Chinese, like you have poachers trying to provide for that market because they're close. And so you actually have some tiger poaching because they believe that tiger bones and tiger claws and whatever, they believe that it's going to cure diseases, which it's not. Um, but down in South India, at least, poaching like that, it really isn't a problem. There's not an ivory market there, which is wonderful, which is wonderful because in Africa, we're losing, that's a whole other horrible presentation I could do about what we're losing in Africa. But no, in the, in the region that I work, it's not an issue. Yeah. 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 Well, I haven't been there, so I actually can't go too in depth on it, but I, I know that there's different ones. And I would say a good rule of thumb is as long as they're not giving rides, because usually the places that give rides, not because it's bad for the elephants, it's obviously an elephant's so big we don't matter, but um, the places that give rides usually are treating their elephants like a ride. Whereas places that have a deep respect for them and that let them have their time alone, and I mean, I know plenty of people that do that, that have access to herds that are semi-wild, that, that depend on some human food, but also spend time out in the forest. And I don't see anything wrong with going and playing in the water with elephants. There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, you're generating income for the local people and they're gonna provide, because anywhere where there's elephants, like in the part of South India where I work, recently there was a mother that drowned, and then they have the baby. So there's, a, there's an elephant camp. They have a camp of elephants that they take care of, and it's like, well, if there's people that want to have a moment with an elephant that they're going to keep the rest of their lives, as long as you're treating the elephants really well, what? Yeah, no, no problem. So just I think just do your homework and make sure that it's a, a really good place that people support. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, rides. Yeah. And uh, what they have are families mm -hmm. that were like the boys and they pay them to so retrieve elephants for change. Whatever they tax. Yeah. And it's amazing, right? Like, it's wonderful. So, yeah, I think, I think it's great. Yeah, I mean, that's, isn't that great? <laughs> like, I've touched an elephant. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if anybody else has questions, I'll take, like, one or two more. And then, yeah, in the back. Shout. My first injury? Oh, I didn't really know how to catch crocodiles that well. And I have to do it a lot. And when you mess up, they get you. Um, so, making sure that's not me. Um, but no, I picked up this croc and she was, you know, you catch a small one, then you catch a bigger one, and you catch a bigger one. The first time I got really injured was I picked up like a six foot crocodile and she started, she started going and as I, was, as I was sort of dropping her, she came back and clamped me on the hand and her tooth went straight through my hand, which really wasn't that bad, actually. It was really scary and I like stepped back and went, ah, but it really wasn't that bad. Yeah, she didn't hold on. That was the thing. That was the good part. Yeah. So, if nobody else has questions, guys, again, thank you so much. I'll be outside.
Um, all right, last thing I'll say, the last thing I'll say is um, the publisher and I teamed up, just like I bring people to the jungle and, have, and try to support the local people, the publisher and I teamed up, a dollar from every book sale is going towards actually creating a sanctuary for tigers, like literally a forest where there's just forest, deer, and some water, like a way station for them. And we're trying to use this book to create that for tigers. So we're literally trying to connect you guys to the issues and to these stories. So please do pick up a copy if you can. And uh, thanks again. <laughs>